Okay, in my last video, we focused largely on episode three of Prehistoric Planet and on two extinct Australian marsupials, Diprotodon and Thylacoleo in particular. This episode included other Australian species, and I will look at these in a bit more detail here, including the giant short-faced kangaroo, the carnivorous kangaroo, and the giant monitor lizard. I'd also like to talk about a couple of species that weren't included, notably the recent descriptions of a gigantic Australian eagle species and Australia's first and only known vulture to date. So if you are interested in any of these, then keep watching. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a paleontologist who does real paleontologist stuff like reconstructing fossils, naming new species, publishing dozens of scientific articles and supervising PhD students. I've even been known to get my hands dirty in the field. And this means that on this channel, you're watching real paleontology from a real paleontologist. I'll start with a closer look at the giant kangaroo, Procoptodon, and presumably the species here is Procoptodon galia, the largest kangaroo ever. Although, as with all the other animals included in the series, the actual species name is not provided. And I'd just like to take a moment here to point out that I find this irritating. I kind of get that they didn't want to use full scientific names, but I see no reason why common names couldn't have been provided, allowing anybody who was interested in a particular animal to do their own research without having to guess the species they were looking at. Anyway, I've heard some others being quite negative with respect to the way in which the giant kangaroo was characterised, but personally, I think the CGI was fantastic. Aside from the fact that this was the biggest kangaroo ever, the main point of interest here is the fact that we are now pretty darn certain that Procoptodon did not hop, but walked or strode. Now, we've known for a long time that there must be an actual size limit beyond which it is physically impossible for an animal to hop. For example, back in 2008 here, McGowan and friends conducted a study to determine the forces placed on the major tendons involved, notably the Achilles tendon here. The capacity of the tendons to store elastic energy plays a major role in the kangaroo's exceptionally high efficiency while hopping. However, beyond a certain body mass, it is physically impossible for this tendon to operate without breaking. And they suggested that the largest short-faced kangaroo species exceeded this body size limit even at very low speeds. In short, they couldn't hop. Before I go any further, I should also point out that there are living species of kangaroo that can and do stride on their back legs, although they are still capable of hopping. I'm talking tree kangaroos here, as aptly demonstrated by this cute little fella. And interestingly, when swimming, all kangaroos move their back legs alternately. Anyway, the argument that these big roos couldn't hop really gained traction with the publication of this paper here in 2014 by Christine Janus and friends. Based on comparisons with living species, Janus pointed to a range of anatomical features in the pelvis and major joints, which they concluded effectively cancelled out any capacity to hop in these big short-faced roos. Since then, a bunch more papers have further supported this conclusion, and the fossil trackway of a large bipedal animal has been attributed to a big roo. Although, as far as I can tell, this has not actually been formally published anywhere excepting a conference abstract. So, just to repeat myself, it is now broadly recognised that these big, short-faced kangaroos couldn't hop. But it's worth noting that the subfamily they belong to, the thin urinae, was quite diverse, with around 26 species recognised, and they certainly were not all giants. 
The smallest formerly recognised species is Procopteron gilli, which weighed in at around 54 kilograms and stood at around a metre high. It's been argued that another older species, Wanabaru hilarus, might also belong to this subfamily, and it was smaller still, around 8 kilograms. I would really like to see a bit more work done before we conclude that all short-faced kangaroos couldn't hop. One thing we can be pretty sure applied to them all is an exceptionally powerful bite, as demonstrated by Rex Mitchell and myself back in 2018 here. So for sure, they could all chomp their way through exceedingly tough vegetation. The next extinct Australian beast we're introduced to is another weird kangaroo, Propliopus ocellans. This is one of five or six species thought to be more carnivorous than your average kangaroo. I actually studied this particular subfamily, the Propliopinae, for my honours thesis decades ago. Now, I think the CGI here was again excellent, and I think there is nothing particularly controversial here. I would point out, though, that among Propliopine kangaroos, Propliopus ocellans was likely among the least carnivorous. If you'd like to drill down for a bit more detail on this killer kangaroo clan, I'll point you in the direction of this earlier video of mine here. Now, our little juvenile carnivorous kangaroo has a run-in with a very big lizard. This is, of course, the biggest lizard ever, Varanus priscus, commonly known as Megalania. Again, this is a species that I've covered in detail in an earlier video. The maximum size of this animal has been the subject of perennial debate, ranging from around 4.5 metres or 15 feet to well over 8 metres or 26 feet. In this prehistoric planet episode, the big lizard is said to be 20 feet long or around 6 metres. An important thing to remember here is that regardless of which maximum size we accept, it is absolutely certain that the average would have been much smaller. Another important point to bear in mind is that pound for pound, any reptile will require far less food than a mammal of the same size. If you are interested in this debate, I would point you in the direction of this paper I published back in 2002. If you'd like a copy, just let me know in the comments section and I'll send you one. Anyway, the fundamental problem here is that we have nothing like a complete skeleton of any size preserved for megalania. Not even nearly. And until we do, all estimates will be characterised by a very large margin of error. On the other hand, none of the behaviour demonstrated in this episode is contentious, including the rather chilling demonstration that Megalania likely ate its own young on occasion. This is certainly known to occur in the Komodo dragon. So along with a number of extinct Australian species, several living species make an appearance. My personal favourite is the wedge-tailed eagle. This is a magnificent bird, and I'm lucky enough to have a few living in my local area. It's one of the world's largest and most powerful eagles, and distinguished by a very distinctive silhouette. Together with colleagues of mine, we have produced three-dimensional biomechanical models of its skull and talons, including the truly gigantic Haas eagle of New Zealand. I covered this in an earlier episode too. Anyway, the main reason I raised this is because in 2023 it became apparent that Ice Age Australia had its very own gigantic extinct eagle that may have rivaled its New Zealand cousin in size. And this gives me a segue into its introduction to a broader audience. It's a shame this wasn't covered in the series, but I suspect it came too late in the day to be actioned on. So, this totally Australian-made gigantic eagle, Gaff's eagle, was described by Ellen Mather and colleagues here. We have a reasonably complete skeleton from South Australia and bits and pieces from elsewhere, but it sure would be nice to get a bit more. In this follow-up 2024 paper, Mather and friends produced size estimates of between 12.3 and 19 kilograms, depending on which metrics are used. To put this in context, 
even the lower 12 kilogram figure is at least twice as heavy as the biggest wedgetail eagle, but still a little smaller than the New Zealand giant. On the other hand, 19 kilograms would put it right up there with the biggest of the big. Another thing to bear in mind here is that the New Zealand giant is known from many more specimens. There may well be much larger specimens of gas eagle out there waiting to be found. Another point of interest in this 2024 paper is the description of a new second species. This second species appears to have been a couple of kilograms lighter than gas eagle, but still a very big bird, significantly larger than the uh, living wedge-tailed eagle. So it's now clear that Ice Age Australia was a domain of a surprisingly diverse range of very large to gigantic raptors. But wait, there's more. One further pretty recent surprise to talk about. But before I do, can I please ask that you like and subscribe? It costs you nothing, but means a lot to me. If you'd like to leave a comment, that would be great too. It works on the algorithm, I'm told. And I can pretty much guarantee that I will respond to it. In 2022, we Aussie paleo folk were pleased to learn that Australia once had its very own vulture, and a pretty darn big vulture at that. Given that a number of vulture species can be found in nearby Southeast Asia, the fact that Australia had apparently not been known to any vulture species had had we Aussie paleo dudes scratching our heads for decades. This new species, Cryptogyps lacertosis here, is the first and remains the only vulture ever found in Australia. It was evidently widespread with specimens found across the continent. So Cryptogyps was yet another big homegrown raptor, further expanding the range of large to gigantic carnivorous birds in Australia. Okay, folks, uh, I will wind this up here. I hope you enjoyed it. And like I said, if you did, then please like and subscribe.